Center. Brother, welcome. Come, be seated. Do you have everything you need? Paper, ink. Good. So we have to finally do this. Understand it is not something I wish to do. Mine is not a life to be proud of. I have done many foolish things, committed many sins. But my companions have convinced me they feel my life should be recorded. And so. And so. I suppose we should start with the calendar. It was the moment that my life changed forever. Picture the scene, Pamplona, the city completely surrounded by the French. We are the last remnants of the army stuck within the city walls, but I am determined we will not fail. I am determined we will not go down without a fight. <laughs> King, we are knights. Imagine the court waiting to hear of our victory here today. Imagine the rewards the king will give us when he hears of that victory. Imagine the women waiting to embrace us in their warm arms, their warm beds. <laughs> we are not here to give in. That is not an option. We are here to show those French pigs what it means to be a Basque knight. So come, let us show them. Let us face them. Let us put the fear of God into them. And then the cannonball came, the object which changed me forever. I was 30. I had my whole life ahead of me, my whole career, but in an instant, all of that was gone. Have you ever stared into the face of glory, only to have it crushed in an instant? Because of this noble blood in my veins, the French treated me well. They tended my wounds. And they even escorted me back to the family castle of Loyola on a stretcher. There, my brother and his wife received me with love. They installed me in a large bedroom with a comfortable bed. But I remember, during that entire journey, all I could think about was what they would think at court. The pain, the humiliation, the determination to show none of it. Not once did I spare a thought for those poor men I had sent to their deaths. As I said, not a life to be proud of, and I would rather not talk about Some of the stories I have told some of you, but much I have never told anybody. Events that, if you heard of, would certainly change your opinion of me. But it is true, I have learnt much from it. And so, I must tell you. I was born the 13th and final child of the noble family of Loyola in the Basque region. People held in high regard. <laughs> they named me Inigo. From a young age, I was brought up to the ancient knightly traditions, unconditional loyalty to the king, upholding the traditions of the court, honoring the family name, learning how to handle weapons, reading, writing, composing poetry, and of course, showing your worth 
especially in front of the wood. Ah, and the Catholic faith. Although I now realise many of those knightly traditions were incompatible with a true life. At the age of 16, I entered the service of the king's treasurer, and so I went often to the Spanish court, the place I wanted to belong to most. The style, the money, the clothes, the protocol, the chance to be seen in the king's processions, to compete in tournaments and, and games, to do brave deeds, and all so I could be noticed by the woman of my dreams. Yes, I too had a woman of my dreams. A very high-ranking lady. Let's leave it at that. At my brother would say that I had diplomatic qualities and that I could reconcile people who were quarrelling, but if I'm honest, fame and women was what my life was for. Ah, and winning larger money, amounts of money in bets, and fighting, and paying juvenile tricks. I remember once, I stole a whole load of fruit from an orchard with some friends, and I ran away. We got away, of course. Some poor man was arrested in our stead. He was asked to pay a fine, he couldn't afford it, so they put him in jail. We said nothing. His family were looking for him for weeks. Another time I got into a fight. I got so angry I drew my sword, and I chased after them. They weren't expecting that. Thankfully, some passers-by stopped me, otherwise I would have surely helped some of them to the next life. Or they would have helped me. Truth be told, at that time in my life, I was not very responsible. In fact, somebody once said to me, Inigo, you will never learn your lesson until somebody breaks one of your legs. <laughs> My leg. It just didn't want to heal. Ah, My brother brought in the best physicians and they saw that the, the bones in the leg were not fusing together properly. And as things stood, I would never be able to walk again properly unthinkable. The only thing for it was to re-break the leg and to reset the bones. It was butchery, but I did think twice. <clears throat> Do it! Do it now! soon became apparent that it hadn't worked. Just under the knee, there was a large bit of bone that was sticking out. I panicked. How could I present myself to the woman of my dreams in the fashionable, tight-fitting trousers of the Spanish court with such an ugly lump? The physician said the only thing they could do would be to saw it off. I didn't think twice. Anything for the woman of my dreams. Either you were a knight or you weren't. But Lord Inigo, the pain you have endured already will be nothing compared to the pain that this will bring. I can't do it! And so now, I had plenty of time on my hands to daydream about the woman of my dreams. <laughs> ah. And of course, many hours of boredom. <laughs> Don't you have anything I can read? Some books about chivalry, or the knights, or romance? Uh, sorry, Lord Inigo. Uh, all we have is a book about the life of Jesus and another about the life of the saints. 
not exactly what I was after, but out of sheer boredom, I gave them a try. I approached, I approached the lives of the saints much as I would approach the life of the knights. All those tales and stories I used to read about. Always wondering, the things the knights have done, would I do? Could I do? For example, I read how Saint Dominic had gone into the land of the infidels, the unbelievers, and when those unbelievers asked him if he was not afraid that they would kill him, he said, please, and preferably chop me up into little pieces. Chop me up into little pieces. I had just had something similar done to me, but not for any God, for the woman of my dreams. <laughs> and then I read how St. Francis had gone to visit the Sultan of Babylon and literally walked through fire. Could I do that? Would I dare to do that? And both of them had given up incredible wealth to live in poverty. I looked at the luxury surrounding me and thought back to my many visits to the lavish Spanish court. Would I dare to give all of that up? <laughs> and if I did, what would the people around me say? Which, of course, led me back to the woman of my dreams. As you can see, it wasn't a very easy time. But during that time, I also noticed a difference. There was a change. When I thought about the woman of my dreams, that noble and high-ranking lady, it was pleasurable whilst it lasted. But afterwards I was left with this feeling of lethargy, tiredness. But when I thought about Francis and Dominic and the saints and what they had done, I was left with this feeling of energy, of excitement. I had a great sense of satisfaction, almost as if somebody had paid me a compliment. Was this a coincidence or did it mean something? I decided to put it to the test and to pay attention to the feelings that emerged. I had the time after all. So I noted down all the emotions that I had. And slowly, I noticed that a pattern emerged. I came to the insight that while some thoughts left me feeling despondent, others left me feeling a, a sort of joy, a feeling so intense I had never had so deeply before. It's this feeling we now call consolation. In all the games and tournaments I had played, I had never experienced this feeling. Never with my amorous encounters, and certainly never with the woman of my dreams. It felt like a gift from heaven, literally. It felt if I can say this, like the language that God was using to talk to me, just like he had with the saints. There was no more talk of being bored. Now I wanted to read and research as much as I could about Jesus and the saints. I talked to everybody around me, to the servants, to my brother, to ask them if they had ever had this feeling of consolation. This feeling that was of God. That was God's way of telling me that what I was doing was good. Ha! Huh. My enthusiasm rubbed off on them. Although my brother did think I was overdoing things a bit. My question now was what 
could I do in the service of my new master? Now no longer his majesty the king, but his majesty King Jesus. With the new woman of my dreams, his mother, the Virgin Mary. Sometimes I saw her in front of me, so clearly, so pure and beautiful. And then I thought back to my old life and how disgusting it had been. I decided I needed to do penance for the rest of my life to make amends. Ah, and so I started there and then, uh, praying on my knees. Oh, it was painful, but it had to be. That was the point. Ah, I said to her, as soon as I am healed, I will come to you in Montserrat, to the famous statue of you there, the Black Madonna. And then, then I will go to Jerusalem as a pilgrim, just like so many of the saints had been before. And I will go as a pilgrim, begging for the money for the voyage. But what was I saying? Begging? Me? A noble man? What would my family say? The disgrace? The dishonour? But I also couldn't dwell on thoughts like that because they didn't bring me consolation. In fact, they brought me the opposite of consolation. Desolation. The opposite of God. The enemy. Huh. My military mind understood the battle well. After nine months, my knee was healed, and so I started to make preparations for my voyage. Ah, my brother, he moved heaven and earth to try to convince me to stay. He took me on a tour of the family castle at Loyola, showing me the family portraits, reminding me of the noble position our family had always held. Ah. And now? Now you want to destroy it all by humiliating us? What will people say? And this after the start that you've had in life. Your, your nobility, your good sense, your energy, your military training. I may be the oldest, but you are the one that everybody loves. You are well known at court. A, a, a couple of years ago, you prevented civil war in these parts and everybody was praising you. And last year, at the Battle of Pamplona, even the enemy, the French gave you a fortnight of first-class care. And now you just want to throw it all away? Please, it is about our family name, the Loyolas. Don't disappoint us. But I didn't listen to him. I knew what was bringing me consolation. Like a banner on the battlefield, I knew the direction I needed to go. Hmm. And so I left. Before I went, my brother made me dress as a man of my station. And even though I didn't want a horse, he gave me a donkey and two servants. In the first village, I sent the two servants back to the poor. for my new master and his mother. I was 30 years old, the same age Jesus was when he started his ministry. In the next village, I bought some rags to show my new station in life. And then I carried on the walk for weeks. And finally, I reached Montserrat. There, I decided to make a confession of all the sins I had committed in my life. So, I started noting them all down. It 
took three days. I presented them to my confessor, and I told him that I was a pilgrim on my way to Jerusalem. The night before I left, I prayed before the statue of our Virgin Mary. All night, seven hours, standing and kneeling. In the morning, I gave my rich clothes to a beggar man on the street. I took out my rags, I put them on, and finally, I was ready to start my pilgrimage. A few hours into the journey, I heard a sound behind me, and some horses approaching quickly. Halt! Palace! We arrested a beggar man in the next village with some clothes of a rich man. We think he stole them, but he insists that you gave them to him for no reason at all. I was just trying to do a good deed by helping that beggar. Instead, I got him into trouble. <sighs> that night, I reached Manresa, and I decided to seek accommodation in a homeless hostel. Ugh. The consolation I felt made me realise that it was the right choice. Those seven hours in front of the Virgin Mary had certainly done me good. In the morning, I went from church to chapel to roadside cross to pray. In that way, I thought I could make amends for the sins of my past. I started to fast and I stopped taking care of my hair and my nails. I went begging from person to person, asking for food, just like a pilgrim. But always piercing me were the thoughts of the things I had done in the past. And the new memories came to me, things I had forgotten from my first confession in Montserrat. So I sought a monastery here in town, and I made another confession. But after that, new memories came. Again, things I'd forgotten, so I made another confession. But this pattern repeated itself over and over again. It was as if they were dancing around me, like evil, grinning monsters. Days, weeks, months went by and the monsters followed me wherever I went. I became desperate. Of course, it wasn't, it was because I wasn't doing enough penance. I started to eat even less. I had problems with my stomach. I deserved it. But it didn't help. Things got to a point where I was so desperate. And in the small room I had in the monastery of my confessor, I climbed up. I looked out of the window and I thought to myself, perhaps I should just jump and finish it all. Then I'd be rid of it. I could even have thoughts like that, that I would consider throwing all the good that had been done to me away, and myself with it. What were these hostile forces I was fighting against? Battling the French in Pamplona and the butchery to my leg were nothing compared to this. And where was the consolation I had found? Had it all been an illusion? We 
these forces were stronger than me. I couldn't stop doing the penances. I even resolved to stop eating my former life. When my confessor heard this, he commanded me, you will immediately stop these excessive penances. You think you can compel consolation by doing penance and making things difficult for yourself by performing heroic deeds? It doesn't work like that. It's well-intentioned, but that is not God's way. He, he has already forgiven you, not because you have done penance, but because he wants to give you his consolation. Remember your sickbed in Loyola. God didn't come to you there because you'd done penance. In fact, the opposite. You are still the same pain in the neck as you are now. No, he tried to capture your attention through the consolation. Just like that, free of charge. Ever since then, I've been a changed man. Happier, more liberated. I went back to the churches, the chapels, and the roadside crosses, but this time to give thanks. I had no idea that this was how God worked. A new world opened up for me. I saw how God, with his quiet consolation, was at work in everything. How he was the creative power and force in nature. How he was the good in everyone and everything that happened. And most importantly, how he was continuously striving and working to capture our attention, to awaken the good within us, just like he had done with me. The revelation, when it came, was so sharp and clear. God was to be found in all things. This was the discovery I had to share with everybody. I started taking care of my hair and my nails. I dressed a little better. I didn't want those things to be a distraction. I realised I was not meant to retreat into a life of penance and prayer. During this time, I had been taking a note of everything that had been happening to me. All the thoughts that had led to consolation and everything that had been led, led to desolation. In the coming months, I would turn these notes into a notebook to help people in their spiritual life, the spiritual exercises. All I needed to do was to take this to the Holy Land, to show people God in their lives and to help them experience the spiritual exercises. So, from the Pope, I gained permission to board a ship to the Holy Land. How I remember that journey. My excitement and anticipation to finally be in the place where our Lord Jesus had stood, had walked, had been born. When I got to the Holy Land, I sought an audience with the superior of the monastery. And there I said to him, I would like to stay here to help pilgrims on their journey with God. Absolutely not. We have enough problems as it is without worrying about crackpots like you. Oh, no, no, you won't have any problems with me. I intend to live as a hermit. I want to show how God, through his consolation, is at work in people's lives. Consolation or not, you'll be going back home on the next ship with the rest of them. And if I refuse, then with the power invested in me by the Pope in Rome, I will expel you from the Catholic Church. I can show you the papers if you like. Oh no, no, that won't be necessary. Helping people in their spiritual life. That was my desire. If I couldn't do that in the Holy Land, 
and it would have to be back in my own country. Immediately in Barcelona, people started to come to me for spiritual guidance. But I had to be careful. The Inquisition was everywhere. If the magistrates thought that I was saying something heretical, they would burn me at the stake. I was convinced nothing I was saying was heretical, but would they agree with me? I decided to start studying again. Studying meant learning Latin. So I found a schoolmaster who agreed to help me. Ah, about the age of 33, I found myself in a classroom with other 12 to 13 year olds learning Latin. Iram, Eratis, Erat. Iramis, Eratis, Erant. <laughs> After two years, my schoolmaster said to me, I don't think I can help you anymore. I think you are ready for the next stage of your studies at the University of Alcala. So, I made the 500 kilometer journey inland to the University of Alcala. And there I went begging from door to door. There were even three young men who joined me and decided to share my life and my ideals. We gave spiritual guidance using the new spiritual exercises. But one day we got a knock on the door. Open up, police! You will come with me! They took me to jail. Ah. And there I waited. Almost immediately, people came to me for spiritual conversation. Some wanted to help, some even offered to pay bail, but I didn't want that. I just waited. After three weeks, eventually the magistrate questioned. At the end of the interview, he asked me, do you know two women, mother and daughter, both widows? Yes, yes, certainly I do. And did you tell them to go on pilgrimage to a site 200 kilometers away? Absolutely not. On the contrary, too dangerous for two such pretty women. I said we had enough churches here in Alcala and poor people to help. Even so, that is what this is all about. It took another month and a half for me to be released. And even then, my companions and I were forbidden from giving any more spiritual direction. You aren't qualified. We have enough trouble with all the well-intentioned quacks. So, I decided to leave and go to Paris. Through benefactors in Spain, I had received enough money to pay for my studies in Paris. I gave them to a man I trusted very much, a friend, to look after it. In no time at all, he had spent it completely. And he couldn't pay me back, so I was once more reliant on begging. It was tough. I found accommodation in a hostel for Spanish people. And because it was so far away from the university, my studies reached a very low point. However, I did spot an opportunity to talk to the other students, to share my discoveries with them, and to give them a little bit of spiritual guidance. Finally, I got a room in the College of Santa Barbara. And there I shared it with three men. One who at the beginning didn't trust me very much. Another, Pierre Favre, a gentleman from the French Alps. And the third, Francis Xavier from Navarre. Not too far from Loyola, but the opposite side of that battle in Pamplona. Pierre would help me with my Greek and theology and I would share with him my deepest dreams and ideals. Hmm. 
Sometimes we had to stop ourselves starting on spiritual subjects because we would talk all day and get no studying done. Francis, our friend, was having none of it. He laughed at us. Ha! What a pair of idiots! All that praying! <laughs> what a waste of time! <laughs> he preferred to go to the Ile de la Cité with his friends and play games and do athletics. He was very good at the high jump. I remember he would do anything to be the best. He reminded me of my younger son. But I talked particularly with Pierre. The poor man didn't know what to do with his life. To be a doctor, a priest, or even a monk, or just get married and get rich. He lurched from possibility to possibility, and as a result, he was plagued by sexual fantasies, the desire to be the centre of attention, scruples, excessive appetite. I remembered all of that from my younger years. I shared with him how I had overcome some of the vices in my life by trusting that there was grace and forgiveness. How did I know what God wanted for me? By listening to the consolation. My dream, my idea, to help others find God's consolation in their life too. Well, will you help me then? He asked. For that, Pierre, you must know what your deepest desire is. That I can somehow, someday, learn to do what you do. To help others find God's joy in their life. You must learn to make everything that doesn't give you inner consolation subordinate to your goal. You have to reject all opposing thoughts and feelings, all so you can realise your life's objective. How? How do I do that? Through practice and hard work. Look at our friend. Francis. He trains every day, training to, to get his body to do exactly what he wants it to do. The spiritual life is just like that. It takes training and hard work. Let me offer you an example. Do you remember how some time ago I went to Rouen, to that man who'd spent all of my money when I first came here to Paris. From Rouen, he asked for me. It took me three days to get there, and when I reached, I found him on his sickbed. I cared for him, tended him, and even found him a ship back to Spain. Now, I could have listened to my feelings of hatred and anger, and trust me, I had them. You can imagine what I felt and what the people around me counselled me to do. But my deepest desire is to help everybody come closer to Jesus. So I had to put aside those feelings and go to him. Now, I offer you this example not to give me glory but simply to show you how hard it is, how difficult. It doesn't come easily, but we can do it through training and hard work. So let's start with the first feeling that gets in the way of you realizing God's love in your life. Only once we have mastered that can we move on to the second. As you can see, four years really isn't that long. And in the course of the fourth year, he was ordained a priest. Our group of three grew into a group of seven. And one day in the chapel of our Virgin Mary in Montmartre, 
we made promises to God and to each other <clears throat> to sever ties with our family and to live a life of poverty and chastity. We decided we would go to Jerusalem, this time for good, and there we would care for pilgrims. And if that wasn't possible, we would go to the Pope in Rome and offer our services. Whatever he asked of us, we would do as if it was a command from Jesus himself. And so we went and waited in Venice for a ship. And how we waited and waited, full of fire for our Lord, but we waited. The war with the Turks meant that the Mediterranean wasn't safe and no ships were sailing. So after a year of waiting, we went to the Pope in Rome. There we asked ourselves, if the Pope was to send us off in different directions, did that mean the end of our group? And if we wanted to stay together as a group, didn't we need a leader, somebody who would take charge and the rest would be subordinate to him? We prayed and prayed and discerned and discerned. Finally, after months, we came to a decision. We would elect a leader and the others would obey him. We wrote down our purposes and principles and presented them to the Pope and asked him to recognise us as a new group. We stated that we didn't want to live in monasteries. We would be where the people were, where the need was greatest. And we would call ourselves Companions of Jesus. That done, we decided to elect our new leader. How I remember it well. <clears throat> Vote one. Ignatius. Vote two. Ignatius. Vote three. Ignatius. Vote four. Ignatius. Vote five, Ignatius. Vote six, Ignatius. Vote seven, Ignatius. Vote eight, Ignatius. Vote nine. I wish to vote for him who has the most votes. My brothers, I do not understand. This is a mistake. I cannot. It would be a grave mistake. You cannot possibly understand. I am not made for authority. I am stubborn, arrogant, foolish. I have told you about what happened in Pamplona all those years ago. How I sent all those men to their deaths simply so I could shine. I haven't changed. That man is still here. My brothers, please. I refused. I asked for a second vote. A second time, they voted for me. A second time, I refused. Fresh in my mind was an incident that had happened just here in Rome a few months ago. An incident that showed me no matter how much spiritual practice I did, no matter how much progress I made, that old Basque knight was still there within me. You see, here in Rome, there was one Dr. Ortiz, a friend of us all. He asked me if he could do the spiritual exercises in the famous abbey of Monte Cresino, a hundred kilometres outside of Rome. This Dr. Ortiz loved to preach. And when he did, he did so in a big, booming voice and everybody in the pews would be shaking. <laughs> now I tell you a story I have never told anybody before. In the first week of the exercises, I asked him to reflect on the faults and failings in his life that had stopped him hearing God's consolation. 
However, after a week, he was so depressed, I started to become worried. I needed to do something to lift his spirit, so I said, what can I do? Perhaps you could do a dance from your home region of the Basque country. Do you think that would help? Yes, I think it would. What could I do? Anything to cheer him up. So, I got into position. A position I had not gone into for many years. And I danced. Afterwards I said to him, you must never ask me to do that again, because I will never do it again. And I said that not because my leg had started to hurt, but as I got into that position, as I did those moves, all those old thoughts that used to fill my head came rushing back, the desires, the urges. It was like I was transported back in time, and suddenly I was in a go again. And now here I was in front of my companions, the men I loved most dearly in the world, and they wanted to put me back into that position of authority. That life which I had rejected all those years ago on my bed in Loyola. It couldn't be. It was wrong. I asked for a third vote. Again, they voted for me. I didn't know what to do. I sought advice from a wise old priest that I knew. I have the feeling that you are trying to avoid the will of God. So after that, I accepted. But to fight that old inigo, I decided to cook dinner for the companions every night from that moment. And so the Pope sent us off in different directions. One to Portugal, another to Southeast Asia, my friend Francis. I would never see him again. Another to North Italy to preach there. Another to South Italy to work in the impoverished areas. Still others to failing monasteries to revive their good spirits. And us who stayed in Rome didn't sit idly. At that moment, there was a lack of grain and so a famine. Many people were dying. There were men and women laid out on the street. We did what we could. We raised money, we gave them food, we provided clothes. We even invited them into the house and cared for their wounds, or washed their feet. Rich people were so impressed, they came and gave donations of money and grain. And amidst all of that, we tried to spread the glory of God's consolation. Men, very impressive men, young and old, joined us. And so, our society grew and grew. Until now, I find myself here, in this office, dictating this story to you. <sighs> Beyond my imagination has been this journey, and yet, it has happened. I tell you the simple facts. I do not exaggerate. I am not a perfect man. I am not a saviour or a hero. I am just a humble sinner who God has chosen for this path. That old Basque knight is still here with you. Ignatius is still in a go. The only difference is before, when that in a go 
refuse to stand tall on his two perfect legs, proud and defiant in law. I, Ignatius, kneel every day in humility and ask you for God's grace and forgiveness. I, Ignatius of Loyola, pledge to you, almighty God, and to your Pope, your Vicar here on earth, in front of the Holy Virgin Mary and all the choirs of angels and his friends here that day. Eternal poverty, chastity, and obedience.